this is my first video update coming to you from Athens, Greece. I am right now at, uh, at the bottom of the Acropolis, actually, at the foot of the Acropolis. And um, behind me is, uh, is the Acropolis area, the area surrounding the Acropolis, where, uh, where a lot of people kind of walk around. They can, uh, they can sit down at restaurants. Uh, have a coffee while viewing the Acropolis, the Parthenon, which is right up this way. Here, let me scroll. Let me pan. Let me scroll. <laughs> let me pan <laughs> the camera so you could see right, right up there. Just go right up over that hill. You get to the to the Parthenon, and we're gonna walk. We're gonna walk around the uh, the Acropolis area and see where this path takes us. And we're going to talk about some uh, some news stories. And the big story that we have to talk about is uh, what's going on in Libya, a country that was uh, torn apart by Hillary Clinton and the Obama administration. Not only Hillary Clinton and the Obama White House, also uh, David Cameron and uh, the UK, as well as I believe it was Sarkozy at the time. They all um, worked together to destroy Libya and Gaddafi, a very brutal, brutal death that uh, was actually caught on, uh, on video. And who, who can forget Hillary Clinton's uh, interview, I believe with 60 Minutes, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where she was cackling and laughing and uh, she triumphantly, triumphantly declared uh, we came, we saw, he died. And now you have, uh, after, all the, after all that time, all these years, uh, Libya has still not found peace. And uh, there was a, a ceasefire that was put in place by the United Nations, which lasted two years. It was put together in 2019, 2020, and it lasted two years, but now you have more uh, more fighting breaking out in Libya. The latest reports are 23 dead and about 140 injured as uh, fighting broke out, uh, I believe around Tripoli. And there are rumors that uh, the two factions which are vying for power are, uh, are going after each other, are, are starting up uh, starting up a conflict again and um basically what you have in libya is ever since uh hillary clinton broke that country into pieces you have two governments you have the the one government which is based in the uh the capital of tripoli it's the government of national community and uh it's led by the prime minister uh al 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 -Beba. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, al Debeba. It's a tough one to pronounce. And uh, you, you have another government, which is uh, based in the city of Tobruk. And that government is, is actually supported by the Libyan parliament. And it's led by, uh, by Fatih Bashagha. And uh, Bashagha actually has the support uh, or he was supported by, and I believe he still still, still does have the support of uh, of the forces of the Eastern commander, who I'm sure everyone heard of a couple of years ago as he was mounting um, an offensive to take over Tripoli of Khalifa Haftar. And he mounted uh, a military campaign. He got very close to taking Tripoli, but was subsequently pushed back in 2019 and that's when you had the uh, the peace agreement the un uh, backed peace uh, peace agreement of 2020 the ceasefire and things had remained relatively calm but divided in libya and now tensions are flaring up once again so that's kind of the background as to where libya is now it's a divided country a fractured country on the one side, you have the government of national unity in Tripoli. On the other side, you have uh, another government, another uh, group which claims to be the government, 
which is supported by the Libyan parliament, by uh, the Haftar uh, coalition, the Haftar group, and they're based in the city of Tobruk. And fighting has now broken out once again in Libya. So let's hope that uh, that the fighting calms down and things don't uh, don't escalate to uh, to more war, because in Libya you have a lot of powers with a vested interest to uh, to see an outcome in Libya that is favorable to them on a geopolitical level. Of course, you have the United States, you have France, you have the UK, you have Russia, you have Turkey as well. And uh, I'm trying to think you, of other countries that have uh, an interest in in swaying Libya one way or another, whether it's the Tripoli government or whether it's the uh, Tobruk-backed uh, government. Anyway, um, that is the news from Libya. So let's get walking and let's do an update on Kosovo, Medohia, and Serbia, a story that I reported on in two video updates yesterday and we have another update now with regards to what Borrell dubbed um, a peace deal between uh, Serbia and the breakaway province of uh, Kosovo and Medohia. And in his tweet yesterday, we have more details as to what actually took place. And that's why I wanted to do an update. And uh, in Borrell's tweet yesterday, he was very, very positive, very enthusiastic. He said, we have a deal. He said that uh, Serbia has agreed to uh, abolish entry and exit documents for Kosovo ID holders. And Kosovo agreed to not introduce ones for Serbian ID holders. That is what Borrell said in a statement. Serbs living in the northern part of the breakaway province, as well as other Kosovo residents, will be able to freely travel between Serbia and Kosovo using their existing ID cards, the statement said, adding that the EU had received guarantees from Prime Minister Kurti to this end. That is a direct quote. Borrell praised the development by saying that, quote, we found a European solution that facilitates travel between Kosovo and Serbia. He also, Borrell also praised Vucic's actions by saying that the Serbian president showed responsibility and leadership today. The senior EU diplomat also thanked the U.S. for their support to the EU-facilitated dialogue, calling it an example of excellent practical EU-US cooperation. But Borrell, in his statement, he did admit that the problem with the license plates had not yet been resolved and called on the leaders of Serbia and Kosovo to continue showing pragmatism and constructiveness in this regard as well. Morel still said that uh, he concluded the statement by saying, today is a very good day. So that was the, uh, the statement from the EU foreign minister, let's call him the foreign minister, Joseph Borrell. And uh, Borrell admitted pretty much that this was not an EU uh, broker deal, but this was a US EU deal. And in my video update yesterday, I noted that the, uh, the Balkan envoy, Mr. Gabriel Escobar, in um, an interview with a Serbian, I believe a Serbian uh, TV channel that's affiliated with CNN. In an interview he gave the other day, he said that uh, Serbia's best option with regards to Kosovo and Medohia is to join the European Union, to recognize Kosovo and Medohia, then to join the European Union, and then de facto be reunited with Kosovo and Medohia because those countries would be part, would be member states of the European Union and under the EU, it would kind of be a, a type of reunification according to Escobar. Uh, of course, Escobar didn't uh, mention that 
By taking such an action, Serbia would be giving up all of its sovereignty um, and all of its, uh, its statehood, its, its culture and history. It would be giving it up to the European Union, getting austerity and, um, and authoritarian rule in return. <laughs> while recognizing that uh, that Kosovo and Metohija is independent. So Serbia would basically have nothing to gain from such a move, not to mention that there's really not much that the EU can really offer a country at this moment in time, given uh, the EU's impending collapse and uh, economic uh, situation. But anyway, um, I don't want to go off on a tangent. Those were the statements by Escobar, and uh, Burrell is noting that this agreement was indeed an EU-US brokered agreement. Vucic, president of Serbia, Alexander Vucic, did not paint such a rosy picture as the one that uh, Borrell painted. Vucic described the talks with Albanians from Kosovo as very unsuccessful, extremely difficult, adding that in the end, we came to the point that we do not agree, that we do not agree on anything. Vucic insisted that mutual recognition will never be on the agenda as Belgrade cannot forget that Kosovo is part of Serbia. He also said that officials in Brussels are wasting their time and money if they think they would be able to facilitate such an agreement. Vucic did confirm that Serbia would accept Kosovo's IDs when it comes to travel, but would only do so for practical reasons, to enable freedom of movement. Such a step cannot be interpreted as recognition of the unilaterally declared independence of Kosovo, nor does it prejudice sovereignty, Vucic added. What is important is that Serbs from Kosovo and Metohija can move and enter and leave the territory of Kosovo and Metohija freely, Vucic said, adding that Belgrade is asking for guarantees from the EU. We ask that every Serb from the north of Kosovo and Metohija can enter the territory of Kosovo and Metohija with Serbian documents and that they can leave whenever they want. Quote, we are always ready for a compromise, but we have to come to that. Kurti is convinced that with their propaganda, they will succeed in convincing the Serbian people to give up their state of Serbia. So those were the statements from um, Serbian President Vucic. He paints a very different picture than the one uh, painted by Burrell. And... Uh, it seems that, that, that Vucic, he, uh, he made a deal out of, uh, out of necessity, understanding that at the moment he needs to, uh, to buy time. Now, I know that Vucic is a very polarizing political figure in Serbia, but uh, he is a clever a cunning and clever politician. And uh, as I said in my video update yesterday, uh, he has to, he has to walk that, uh, that tightrope between the European Union and NATO, which is surrounding Serbia, a very aggressive NATO, which is surrounding Serbia and a very aggressive European Union and between Serbia's alliance, their friendship with uh, the Russian Federation. So Vucic has to play the game a little bit longer. He has to find, he has to walk that tightrope and find that balance a little bit longer as, uh, as the military conflict plays out in Ukraine. And, uh, and then once that military conflict in Ukraine concludes, once we get a better picture of, uh, of territory gained or lost and of, uh, of this new world order that is being built, then I believe that uh, the Serbian government, 
whatever government that will be, whether it's a Vucic government or a different government, will probably be able to make some more concrete moves and better choices with regards to where they line up in the world order, i.e. if they're going to go the European way or if they're going to go the way of the BRICS. And I firmly believe that uh, Serbia's future lies with the BRICS. We'll see. We'll see how everything shakes out. But for the time being, what's needed right now is, uh, is buying time, patience and buying some time. It's a difficult situation a very tough situation for the Serbian government to maneuver within because you have a lot of pressure from the uh, from the State Department who do want to open up a second front with regards to Serbia and Kosovo but uh, but the Serbian government is going to have to play the game they're going to have to uh, to play the game and buy some time until until various other geopolitical pieces um are are put into place so that is the update with regards to uh to serbia so now we have a, a full picture of things a rosy outlook from borel a not so rosy outlook from Vuc vucic but a kind of necessary a necessary deal that had to be made for the time being let's now switch gears to talk about Hungary. And Hungary is an important country for, uh, for Serbia. And I'll explain why in, 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 a, in a bit. But uh, Hungary, they're saying that uh, they will not, under any circumstances, negotiate uh, an energy. They will not negotiate energy sanctions against Russia. They're done. They're done negotiating with energy sanctions. They're done with uh, energy uh, another sanctions package related to uh, to sanctioning energy, gas, and oil. Uh, Hungary is out. And the foreign minister of Hungary, Peter Sejarto, said, we're not even willing to negotiate any sanctions on energy, be it oil or gas. This is what he said during an economic forum in Tihanu. And he added that the courage of the Hungarian government has helped Budapest to withstand pressure from Brussels. There is no security of energy supply to Europe without using Russian sources. Sajarto stated, arguing that Russian gas cannot be replaced in the foreseeable future. The Hungarian foreign minister also added that the largely misguided Sanctions response to Russia's military campaign is one of the factors driving up inflation and contributing to a global recession. Now, Hungary's economy is heavily dependent on oil and gas from Russia. I don't know if, uh, if everyone remembers, I think it was the sixth energy package, either the fifth or the sixth uh, sanctions package, sorry, the sanctions package. I think it was either five or six where uh, the EU wanted to ban Russian oil and gas, but they knew they couldn't. So they ended up uh, banning the tanker delivery shipment of oil and uh, I believe just oil in this instance to uh, EU countries, but they ended up banning that for a later time period. It would come into effect in January. And then they kind of uh, carved out various exemptions. One of those was for Hungary because they were getting the uh, the oil and uh, and gas via pipelines and so they created all kinds of carve they created all kinds of uh, carve outs and exemptions and um they even ended up walking back the oil tanker shipments as well that that has that has kind of not worked out well for the eu either and they did that with uh with shifting the sanctions and placing them on insurers and then walking that back and now they're talking about uh, oil price caps, and it's just basically a general mess. They can't figure out, the EU can't figure out, uh, how do you place sanctions on Russian oil and gas while continuing to receive Russian oil and gas, right? That's their Gordian knot, <laughs> and it can't be solved. <laughs> this can't be solved because it's ridiculous to believe that such a thing is possible. How do you... How do you starve Russia 
from uh, exporting oil and gas while at the same time buying Russian oil and gas. Anyway, uh, Sajarto is basically saying that Hungary is done with all of this, uh, this childish behavior from the European Union, and rightfully so. Hungary is the one country in the EU that has taken uh, a level-headed, smart, logical approach to the, uh, to the sanctions policy of, uh, of the EU, to, to the approach as to how the EU handles the, um, the conflict in, uh, in Ukraine. Hungary has been the one voice of reason. Unfortunately, the EU doesn't really listen to, uh, to Hungary. As a matter of fact, they take the exact opposite approach and they attack Hungary. Opa. All right, so you can see the Acropolis, the part. Hmm. Can't really see the Parthenon. I think you can see the Temple of Athena Nike in the distance up there, a little bit of it. Anyway, all right. So Hungary, you know, Hungary and Serbia, to me, those two countries working together, aligned together, that to me is the key for a Central Eastern Europe that is aligned with the BRICS. If those two countries can continue to forge close ties together, if they can work together, if they can break free from... Uh, from the European Union and find a way to uh, to build ties with uh, with Russia, with China, with the East, with Eurasia, then that's the key. That's the key to unlocking this this energy landlocked puzzle. And of course, a lot of this is dependent on um, on where Russia. And where Russia ends up with the uh, special military operation. I have no idea where the entrance is for, <laughs> for this, by the way. <laughs> I have no clue where the entrance is. Um, if Russia does make it all the way to the, uh, the western borders of Ukraine and they decide to, to take most of Ukraine to Transnistria and to the borders of, uh, of Hungary, then you might, uh, you might very well have solved uh, a very big uh, landlocked puzzle for Serbia and for Hungary. That is, of course, if Hungary and Serbia can find a way to, uh, to break free from EU Western uh, hegemony or if they want to break free from EU Western hegemony. So that is the update on Hungary. And let's do a couple more stories before we get into a clown world. Let's see here. I've got a really weird clown world as well. Very weird. So we talked a lot about how, um, how this $3 billion in aid let me sit down here. Three billion. I mean, two point nine nine billion in uh, Bidenopolis aid to Ukraine was nothing more than medium to long term MIC military contracts. Well, we've got the first deal signed for these medium to long term military contracts. The Pentagon came out with a statement a couple of days ago, and they said, "Look." The three billion, for the most part, the money is going to be used to uh, to contract military industrial complex companies so that they can start building weapons and air defense systems for Ukraine. And this is going to happen in about three years, they said, one to three years. Um, and you know, I, we took this at the Duran, uh, Brian at the New At Atlas. We all took this as an admission that. Uh, these weapons aren't really going to Ukraine in order to uh, to fight the present day war. But this is more of just kind of getting contracts signed up, signed, sealed, stamped, delivered to the MIC, getting them uh, into the budget before 
<laughs> the, uh, the collapse of the Ukraine government, getting all of those contracts in place before the government collapses so that the MIC can, uh, can make some money from, uh, can continue to make some money from the conflict in Ukraine. And once the, uh, the government collapses, the Alensky government collapses, well then, you know, all these weapons that have been allocated for, uh, for development, production and delivery to Ukraine can just get uh, reallocated, redistributed to, to other conflicts and to other countries. That's basically, so in three years time, when the uh, Ukraine conflict is, is, uh, is over and forgotten about, these contracts can, uh, can be reallocated to, I don't know, Poland or Romania or some other conflict, Libya, you know, who, who knows? Who knows what, uh, what's going to be going on in three years' time? But we do have the first contract put in place, and that is uh, a Pentagon deal for $182 million with UM's arms manufacturer Raytheon, and they're going to produce uh, NASAMS. N-A-S-A-M-S, National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems, supposedly for the Ukraine military. Uh, the work is, is on short and medium-range air defense weaponry and will be conducted at Raytheon's facilities in Tuxbury, Massachusetts, with an estimated completion date of August 23rd. 2024 and this is according to the u.s department of defense in a statement they made on friday so 2024 that means that these weapons could be ready for use in 2025 26. <laughs> this is just the first of many many weapons uh contracts that are going to be uh put in place from this 2.9 billion from Bidenopolis. This is a small one, 182 million. Expect a lot more and uh, a lot bigger contracts to the MIC. Let's, um, hmm, what should we do now? Let's walk a little bit and we'll do a clown world. All right, I know where we are now. Okay, let's do a clown world and we will wrap this up. And in this clown world, I am showing everyone a tweet from the Defense Ministry of Ukraine, blue check mark. And the tweet says, Bavovnutko, Bavovnutko is a ghost animal, fluffy and restless at night. Bavovnutko quietly comes to the occupier's bases, depots, airfields, oil refineries, and other places full of flammable items and starts playing with fire there. And you can see the tweet of, uh, of this furry, fiery thing called uh, ba Bavovnutko. I'm, uh, I'm not pronouncing this correctly at all, but from what I understand, uh, it this this name is derived from the ukrainian word for cotton if i'm not mistaken but what, i don't even know what to make of this tweet to be quite honest is this a threat is this saying that uh this animal is going to continue to to blow up uh ammo depots and and things like this is that the the purpose of this <laughs> this this thing, <laughs> this uh, Bavo Bavovnuatko thing, to threaten the uh, the Russians, it's going to take out uh, bases, depots, airfields, and oil refineries, 
and it's going to set other things on um, on fire. So Russians beware of this furry animal. <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of at a loss for words with, with this very bizarre tweet. I think uh, the Ukraine Ministry of Defense is losing its mind. <laughs> I, I mean, if this isn't proof that uh, that Ukraine is fighting a media war, then uh, I don't know what more proof you need. Uh, <laughs> bravo, bravo, vnu, vnuatko. Let me know how you pronounce that in the comments down below. I think I'm going to end the video there. I, I just don't have anything to say about this tweet. To me, it shows that the Ukraine Ministry of Defense is, is losing its mind. I mean, it is losing its mind. Opa. All right, so I'll end it there, everybody. Whew, the Duran, not locals.com. Take care.